This is Distant Replay. Well, in this mini-sode of the Distant Replay podcast, we're going to go back to true crime and talk to you about Ugeth Urbina. You probably know of him. You probably heard of him. Very good pitcher in the major leagues for a number of years, about a decade he played. Played for a lot of different teams, most notably the Expos, the Marlins, the Red Sox. You probably remember him. He was a pretty good closer and a two-time All-Star. But what you might not have heard about is a lot of the things that happened off the field and uh, and charges that eventually came down on him uh, back in 2007. So we're going to tell you that story today on the podcast. I'm Ben George. He's Mike Noto. And and Mike, I always love these because I always learn something new about a guy. And and you get Urbina as a guy that probably most baseball fans remember and probably a lot of sports fans. But I definitely didn't know the story of his uh, off-the-diamond antics. Yeah, when I was doing some research into who who I should do an episode on, his name came up, and I'm like, you get Urbina. I'm like, the pitcher? I'm like, Oogie Urbina? What did he do? <laughs> and I started looking into it. It's one of these things you start looking into, and you're like, whoa. Yeah. Like, had this stuff happened to this guy in the last 15 years as opposed to the previous 15 years – before that, like you would have, this guy would have been front page news everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but like you mentioned, Ben, he, he he pitched in the major leagues for 11 years. Very good closer. He was on that World Series champion team with the Marlins in 03, which I think is what people will remember him for. He spent time, like you said, at the Montreal Expos, the Red Sox, the Rangers, the Tigers, and the Phillies. He's the only player with the initials UU in Major League Baseball history. So a little, little bit of a little, tidbit there. A little nugget for you. Little nugget for you. He's from Venezuela. So that's where he's from. And that's where a lot of uh, the crimes he was involved in and, and related to him, you know, happened in the country of Venezuela. And an overall theme that you see with Urbina and you see with a lot of these professional athletes or celebrities that go back to their native country is they're sort of a, a target sometimes of, of kidnappers or criminal activity in general, because often they come from areas that are more, that are poor. And they're viewed as the people who have money. So if you're poor and you don't have money and uh, you have a certain kind of mindset, you're like, well, why don't I go get the money from the people who have it, right? I yeah. mean, look at it from the most elementary uh, sort of way to look at it. And these are the kinds of things that – issues that he was involved in throughout a period of his life in Venezuela. The first issue that where he sort of popped up on people's radar from a true crime perspective were his mother's, was his mother's kidnapping in September of 2004. Okay. Now, what's important to remember about Urbina is it's unrelated to the criminal activity I'm going to get to, but his father died in the mid 90s in Venezuela after he resisted a robbery attempt and was shot. So you sort of that in the backdrop for the Urbina, and then we get to his mother's kidnapping in September of 2004. Crazy stuff. Yeah. His mother was kidnapped by four people dressed as police officers, and they held her for a $6 million ransom. So the thinking was, you know, she was, she lived in this, in this smaller, uh, I'm not going to call it a village, but smaller town in Venezuela. She had this big house because by this time you get Urbina is in the major leagues for almost a decade. So her house sticks out from the rest of the ones on her block because it's a big house. And, you know, the kidnappers were attracted to the wealth and it's, I don't think I, you probably have heard about this, Ben, where people who have money in general in these areas are targets for crimes like this. Mm-hmm. So the kidnappers, who you would later find out were Venezuelan drug runners, they, they kidnap her and they held her captive for five months, okay? Wow. Now, five months they held her captive. Now, the reason why it was that long of a captivity was his family, Ugeth Urbina, refused to pay the ransom. So that's what sort of held things up. Now, he was in contact with the kidnapper six times throughout the five months. Now, remember, this incident happens in September of 2004, where he's in the middle of a major league baseball season and is now going into the off season here. Yeah. In December, he says in December is when they officially asked him for the ransom, right? And you might say, like, well, how did Urbina know she was even alive? Yeah. We're talking five months here. Yeah. And I guess he would ask the kidnappers questions that only she would know the answer to. Yeah. And that's how he knew that like, you know, it was a, given assurances that she was still alive. All right. So this all leads to the communication with the, with the kidnappers, the, the, her being captive. This all leads to February 18th, 2005. 
when they finally say, all right, we're going to execute the Venezuelan military is going to execute a an operation to go basically save you get there being his mom. OK, mm-hmm. picture it like she's in a village and on like a, on like a mountainside. So not okay. a super easy location to get to. So this is like a an orchestrated attempt to go save her because, again, he's refusing to pay the ransom. Yeah. All right. They had to arrive. The people going to save his mother had to arrive via boat to surprise the captors. Right. So they couldn't come over with, uh, you know, do it a mountainside. It may not have been possible to come over with a, with a helicopter or a plane. The rescue operation took eight hours. So this is a serious operation going on. This is a professional operation. This isn't like some of uh, Urbina's friends and him going out there and trying to rescue the mother. This is a a military style operation is what it was called. Okay. Okay. The rescue takes eight hours. Two of the captors are killed in the raid. Two of them are caught and seven others escaped. Jeez. There's reports of explosions at the site. Weapons at the site that were confiscated. They they find Mrs. Urbina. She's returned to Caracas where she's reunited with Ugeth. And just a wild story. Now, she said the worst part of her captivity was the kidnappers saying that like Urbina must not love her if they're not willing to pay that he's not willing to pay the ransom. You know, they were sort of playing that card with her. She said that was the worst part. Of the, of the kidnapping is not knowing what was going on, obviously being there for five months, but just a wild story of sort of an abduction that had a good ending because they, again, they rescued her. Not these situations don't normally, you know, end like this, but just a wild story of a military style operation to go get her. And this was right around the time where you report for pitchers and catchers, right? Like yeah. February 18th. Yeah. He literally went from his mother being saved, then being reunited. Him saying, "Oh, mom, I'm so glad that you're you're back. I'm so glad you're okay," and then went right to spring training. <laughs> hey, man, you so, gotta, you, hey, when you like, you gotta take advantage of that opportunity when you have it. I mean, I, I can see where that comes from. You know, like, okay, you're safe, great, but we have to go earn this money while we can because we don't have anything else. Yeah, and and it's and it's later in his career, so maybe he needed to do that to get a uh, to get a roster spot. But I thought that was an interesting little nugget there. So we have his mother's kidnapping. That's sort of one huge incident, and I. It, Go back if, if you have time. Go back and read about this because he, the 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 sort of details of the military operation were were pretty cool to be honest. Like it felt like a movie, you know, arriving via boat. Yeah, it uh, sounds like it could be a movie. An, an eight hour rescue, you know what I mean? Like the captors escaping, but the, they caught some of them. You know, just the whole thing, explosions. Like it's yeah. just. It's really a miracle that she was alive, you know, uh, when they found her. So now, good news there, but not so good news would follow later in 2005. Now, let me ask you one thing before you get to that one. Yep. Are you aware, like this is a, obviously a big part of his background and his story, but were you aware of the incident that happened uh, in the January before his mom got kidnapped where he was uh, charged for firing gunshots? I was. Okay. Yeah, he was. If you Do, do you have any specifics on that? Well, no. The only thing yeah. that I saw was that he was he was fired, he fired shots in a like an upscale Caracas neighborhood. Was arrested, but the judge ended up ruling that he fired the gun in self defense because a man on a motorcycle tried to rob rob him. So I guess that was actually the story, and that's what actually would happen. But kind of, it's kind of you kind of tie that in like it's it's part one part. Hey, when you're a person like this stature in a you know a poor country and community, you got to always kind of have your guard up. But also like you know what. Urbina is not afraid to pull out his gun or try to harm someone should the uh, scenario present itself. Yeah, that's an excellent point to bring that up because it shows a pattern, right? His father's death. Remember, his father died trying to thwart off a robbery attempt. You have his mother's kidnapping. You have him using a gun in self-defense. This is all happening in Venezuela, right? And it sort of all leads to November of 2005 where he's arrested, okay, from an incident that happened on October 16, 2005. How the story goes is Urbina was was sort of alerted to the fact or had a feeling that people who worked on his farm were stealing from him. And more and more specifically, they stole a gun from him. So picture, you know, you have workers that are around the house a lot. You know, you think like something got stolen, it's them. You know, that's sort of the thinking for Urbina at this time. Well, instead of calling the police, Urbina, you know, takes matters into his own hands. 
sort of similar to shooting off the gun, similar to not negotiating with people who are holding his mother for $6 million ransom. Yeah. He decides to take matters into his own hands. He goes after the five. Now, there's five workers here, not just one. He goes after them with a machete. He also tries to pour gasoline on them and light them on fire. These people ended up with cuts from the machete. They ended up with burns on them. So he was almost like successful in doing this. He didn't end up killing anyone, but he got arrested for attempted murder. I mean, you can't get any more attempted murder than that. So he what, tried to cut people with a machete and he tried to light them on fire. What 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 did they try to steal? A gun. A gun. They, you know, okay. A gun of, of Urbina's did get stolen. Okay. And he thought that it was one of them uh, that did it. So he was going to chop unclear them up and burn them. They actually did it. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. hey, you stole my gun. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to sure. chop you up with a machete, five of you. I'm going to chop you up with a machete, and then, you know, as sort of a grand finale, I'm going to light you on fire. Okay, just make sure I'm clear. Okay. Yeah, that's where Urbina is at mentally right now. So he's brought on trial for attempted murder, and I don't know how what the bar is in Venezuela to get convicted for attempted murder, but look, I mean, if you go after someone with a machete and try to light them on fire, I think it's pretty easy to surmise that you your intent was to kill them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, he's sentenced to 14 years and seven months on March 28, 2007. He got released uh, in December of 2012. So he served. He served. You know, he, he remember the incident happened in 2005. He's finally released from prison in 2012. So he, we're talking about seven years he served between you know the time served from when he got arrested through December of 2012. He was on the Phillies in 2005 when this happened. But we're just into the off season when it happened, like literally in October. He was a free, so he was technically a free agent when it happened. And just obviously, as you can imagine, you know, this I think goes without saying, ended his major league career. Yeah. He might have been able to pitch some more. I mean, he was a pretty good relief pitcher 10 years into his career. Theoretically, he probably could have continued pitching in some capacity. He denied, he still denies involvement. And he says he was sleeping at the time of the incident. So he's just like, no, it was not me who cut them with a machete or tried to light them on fire. I was fucked. I was, you know, I was taking a nap. <laughs> you know, I almost dropped an F bomb there if you heard it, but yeah, I, I, I was, I was sleeping. I was not there. So yeah. that's what he says. Obviously, huge disconnect there. Um, and I'm airing on the side that it was probably the people who worked for him recognized it was him with the machete. <laughs> so, oh boy. This all ends. He gets out of jail. Tried to make a baseball comeback. He pitched in the uh, Venezuelan league. I mean, I know me and you are familiar with these leagues in these uh, Latin American countries that sort of go on in the off season of Major League Baseball. Yeah. Um, tried to make a comeback. You know, was not successful, and uh, couldn't find much on what Ugi Urbina is doing now. But basically, this guy had played eleven years in the major leagues. Had his father um, die in a robbery attempt had his mother abducted and saved in a military-style operation, and then was put in jail for 14 years for the attempted murder of five of his farm workers. So just a little bit of a different story than we've, we've gone through in the past here on these episodes where, you know, one of the crimes, you know, he had nothing to do with, with the abduction of his mother, but something he was very much involved in. Right. Wow. What a wild ride for your boy Yugi. Urbina. Oogie, Oogie, Oogie. Urbina. You, you. Yeah, he, look, this guy was a bit, if you followed baseball back then, and like name. you mentioned, we talked a little bit beforehand. This was sort of when fantasy baseball was becoming really popular and saves are a category in fantasy baseball. So even if you played fantasy baseball back then, you know the name, you get Urbina. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, it's an interesting story, Mike, and one that I was not aware of. Uh, so thanks for bringing it on to Distant Replay and taking us through that story, a wild ride, and we will have more stories just like that in future episodes. Connect with us online, distantreplaypodcast.com, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on YouTube. Hit subscribe, rate, review, and we'll talk to you next time.